Welcome to the Connecticut River Conservancy's online training video for water chestnut pool volunteers. In this video, we will cover water chestnut history, anatomy, removal techniques, disposal options, and additional information to be aware of. You'll find timestamps here if you wish to skip ahead. The water chestnut is an annual plant found in the Connecticut River watershed. It is an invasive, non-native plant to the area. It grows and reproduces fast. If left unattended, it will easily spread over an entire water body and push out all other fauna and flora. The species was introduced to the United States from Europe in 1877 at the Cambridge Botanical Garden at Harvard University. It was planted in lakes and ponds in Massachusetts and quickly spread past said ponds to the rest of the eastern coast. It can now be found all along the coast from the state of Virginia to Canada. So what does a water chestnut look like? Here is a drawing of a water chestnut. The nut or seed, the stem, submerged leaves, the rosette where you'll find surface leaves, air pockets, and eventually new seeds. Let's start at the seed. Here is a water chestnut seed freshly collected from a cove in Massachusetts. As you can see, these mean looking nuts have four sharp edges around. Be careful not to prick yourself when pulling. The seeds are green and soft while they form under the parent plant and black and hard when they're fully developed and ready to fall. Next, we have the root. When the water chestnut seed sprouts, the roots will dig into the sediment, usually in soft sand and silty river beds making it harder to pull the plant out. The roots have purple and white colorations. Let's follow the stem of the plant. As you can see here, the stem splits into two thinner stems. Indeed, water chestnut seeds can grow multiple rosettes. If I follow this one, I will find a tiny rosette growing at the end of it. Along the stem, you will find submerged leaves that when fully developed, look like angel wings that help it grow and feed on underwater nutrients. If we keep following the stem, we finally get to the rosette. Some leaves will grow further down the stem to allow the plant to spread wider. Water chestnut will not overlap unless overcrowded. They will take over the surface of the water and block any light from reaching other underwater organisms. You can see the little air pockets under the plant in this video, and on this next picture, you will see a fully formed rosette with well-defined air pockets to allow it to stay afloat and use seeds that are still green and soft. The rosettes start out small when they are under the surface. When they reach the surface, they are roughly 1 to 2 inches in diameter. Over the months of June, July, and August, they will keep growing to reach sizes of 10 to 15 inches in diameter and often more. In August and September, seeds will form under the rosette, and again, when the seeds are fully developed, black and sharp, they will fall to the bottom of the water body and create another plant in one of the next 12 years. Each seed is vi viable for 12 years. Each rosette can grow 10 or more seeds, which is why it is a very fast spreading invasive. Later in the season, around July, you may see a little white flower growing in the center of the rosette. This animation shows you how fast water chestnut can spread from one generation to three. Parent plants die every fall after dropping their seeds, but in the spring, those seeds will sprout to spread 10 times more seeds than their parents before them. We have to do our best to collect water chestnut as early as possible before they drop their seeds and create another endless cycle of growth and spread. Now how do we remove this invasive? There are a few techniques used over the years. Mechanical harvesting, herbicide treatments, and hand pulling, which we will focus on in today's video. But first, a little bit about the mechanical harvests and herbicide treatments. This is Log Pond Cove, and no, that is not a field on land. It is the biggest water chestnut infestation located in Holyoke, Massachusetts. The infestation there is so big Water chestnuts grow so close together, they block any light from going through and form multiple layers at the surface. At Log Pond Cove, there can be no recreation, habitat for aquatic wildlife, or enough oxygen to sustain underwater organisms. 
at Lac Pont Cove, we use both mechanical harvesters and herbicide treatment, though expensive, much more effective at this location than hand pulling. Hand pulling is the preferred removal technique in locations where the infestation is manageable by staff and volunteers. It is much more effective than other harvesting methods at said locations because it can guarantee that the plant is fully removed without dropping seeds or leaving parts of the plant behind. To conduct a hand pull, you will need a canoe, kayak and paddles of course, or other watercraft, a PFD or a life jacket, work gloves, kitchen gloves work well too, polarized sunglasses to see the surface of the water better, work shoes or water shoes, and bags to carry the plants. We will talk about bag options later in this video. In the next few videos, we will demonstrate three different hand pulling techniques. It is important to collect the entire plant, as seeds that are left in the ground may sprout new rosettes, and rosettes with enough stem and submerged leaves may keep growing and form new seeds. The first one we call the spaghetti method. You want to very gently grab onto the plant as far down the stem as possible and coil the stem around your hand like a spaghetti string, keeping enough tension to unroot the seed. Here is another video of the same technique from a different perspective. In this next technique, we use the momentum of our kayak or canoe to create that perfect tension on the stem, gentle but stern enough to unroot the seed. Be careful, if it is too windy or the currents are too strong, the momentum of your boat may snap the stem. Again, another video showing you this technique from a different perspective. The third technique is useful if the seed is stuck or well rooted to the ground. With gentle tugs at the stem, you can disturb the ground underwater, allowing you to dislodge the seed and well spread roots. Doing circles with the stem also helps disturb the ground. And here is a closer look. If this looks intimidating, don't worry about it. You may snap stems the first few times, but you will quickly get the idea and become a pro water chestnut puller. So now you have all these water chestnuts in your boat. What should you do with them? Well, there are a few things you can do, but before we get into that, we should talk about what you collect them in. It is best to place the plants you collect directly in a container while pulling to avoid accidentally dropping plant matter back in the water. You can use old and empty coffee burlap bags. They allow the water to drain while keeping the plants and sharp seeds in without risk of tearing the bag. You can find them at any local coffee roasters facilities. They would be happy to give you several for a good cause. We also have them available in Greenfield, Massachusetts and Middletown, Connecticut if you'd like to take them directly from the Connecticut River Conservancy. You can use heavy duty trash bags, but be careful, the seeds can tear those and they do get heavy when they are filled with water. You can use contractor buckets, though it might be hard to carry those in a kayak and they do get heavy as well. And you can use two shopping baskets and tie them to the bow of your kayak like so to collect and allow the water to drain at the same time. Pause here to view the plans. Now for disposing. The first option is to compost them in your backyard with the rest of your garden compost. Water chestnut are mostly water, so after a few days of drying outside, they will have shrunk to almost nothing. If you decide to do this, be careful not to compost your plants on a floodplain, where the seeds could potentially roll back down into the river and grow new plants. The second option is to take them to your local transfer station or composting facility. You can dispose of them in the brush piles. If none of these are feasible, you can also let them compost in an area off the infestation site you pulled them from, again off the floodplain to avoid seeds rolling back into the river. 
Before you go, here is some additional information you will need when interacting with water chestnut. This is cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria can be incredibly dangerous, as some strains have the ability to produce toxins called cyanotoxins. If you come in contact with cyanobacteria, you risk illness. In summer, water chestnut infestation sites may be affected by cyanobacteria. If you see it, do not approach it and leave the site immediately. Your safety is a priority. This is hydrilla. Hydrilla is another very aggressive invasive plant growing in the watershed. If hydrilla is broken into bits, every single one of those bits can grow a new plant. To avoid spreading it, if you see hydrilla around water chestnut, do not pull the plant. If you see or you suspect to see hydrilla, contact Jim Straub. When you are done with your pull, make sure you clean your boat of any plant matter, and if possible, rinse with water. You do not want to spread water chestnut or other invasives to another water body. This concludes our water chestnut removal training. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us. And if you see a water chestnut plant in an area where it has not been found before, please let us know. You can find more information at ctriver.org water chestnut.